Nurul, Director of the Center for Cybercrime and Security Innovation and Principal Lecturer in the School of Law, Criminal Justice and Computing at Canterbury Christ Church University in the United Kingdom. Sir, we warmly welcome you and we are extremely honored to have you here with us today. I would like to invite Senior Lecturer Dr. Vijendra Gunatilaka to give us a brief introduction on Professor Abe in the room. calculating my age from the information we got. Uh, well, it is an honor and privilege to be here this afternoon, not only because I get a chance to talk to you, but also it uh, takes me down the memory lane some uh, probably 40 years now. In between 1982 uh, and 85, I used to teach uh, electrical power systems to the uh, KDA cadets. It was not the KDU at that time, it was the KDA, the Kukalawa Defense Academy. And uh, as uh, you heard from J Dr. Jendra, in 1985 things changed. I moved from electrical engineering to uh, computer engineering. So uh, that's my connection. I was presently uh, I was, I was very impressed, presently impressed to see the, uh, I, I witnessed two presentations this afternoon when I came in. And uh, um, I'm very happy that the quality of presentations and the subject material covered and uh, the 
style of presentation was excellent. So that is a positive for all the presenters, and I am very thankful that I got the chance to uh, list to at least two of them. And one of the presentations also did the fair I do want to go into details of encryption when I talk about some of my material here because he has already covered the data encryption and, and uh, so on. And I think it was uh, Mr. Dinasena's uh, presentation. <clears throat> okay, um, how much time do we have? Um, because it is a session on computing and uh, I was supposed to address the uh, session on smart solutions for global challenges, um, I thought uh, a topic like computer science and smart, smart currencies would be quite appropriate for this afternoon's uh, presentation. So, um, let me tell you a little bit about the challenge we have. Firstly, uh, the challenge was to create a currency that is free from the central control that we have from various governmental uh, agencies like the central banks and the ministries and so on. Because at the moment, the currency systems are all governed by them. They take decisions as what and how we could use our currencies. So people wanted to be free from that. So that was the challenge. The, the reason for this central control is to actually combat a problem. The problem is called double spending. Now, if you have some money in a bank, I could spend the money, and if I'm fast enough, before that transaction is ledgered in the bank, I could spend the same money for something else. And that's called double spending. And that's a fraudulent attack. So that is why our banking system is so complex that you have ledgers and complex transaction recordings and databases and people working throughout the day to make sure that this double spending is not happening. Now the moment you decentralize or lose the central control, this is one of the problems of uh, systems where you have to prevent this double spending. The other challenge was to create a currency that works across national boundaries. I'm sure you'd have experience, at least some of you have traveled abroad. You have to get foreign currencies. You have to go to those states when you were traveling the first time. You have to get uh, central bank permission to carry foreign currencies. So um, that is a challenge that, again, people are thinking about what a new currency could achieve. So what do you think is the solution? Who is owning a cryptocurrency? How many? What kind of? Yes, the answer is correct. We call it electronic cash and uh, commonly known as cryptocurrencies or virtual currencies because this is something not tangible. You can't touch it, you can't feel it, but it is there, it does the job, but it is virtual. So therefore we call it virtual currencies. So, with that introduction, let me just take you through what I want to cover. Blockchain technology is something that is intimately related to cryptocurrencies. And uh, I will talk a little bit about the crypto cryptographic uh, hash. Uh, I, I, I heard uh, uh, one of your colleagues talking about the encryption and uh, cryptography. Then I'll talk a little bit, bit about the current state of the cryptocurrencies. And from my own perspective, uh, you heard that I'm interested in the forensic aspects of uh, various things, including mobile forensics and internet of things forensics. And this is also an area that I'm interested in, that is the forensic issues related to cryptocurrencies. Because as you can imagine, anything that is uh, related to a computer, anything in digital form, there's a, there's a risk of hacking. So pretty much that is there for cryptocurrencies as well. As well as um, people can use it for various nefarious activities like money laundering and things like that. So therefore, that is a serious issue that we need to uh, work on. And finally, I'll do a few concluding remarks. So, if I put uh, the, the two sides um, or two parts of my topic, computer science and modern currencies, their relationship is 
that it brings you uh, to a platform where one can create a currency which will meet all my challenges that I specified at the beginning. It will be uh, a currency that will uh, allow me to free, be free from the central control, so it will be decentralized. It will be a currency that will be um, um, will be able to be used across boundaries to all these national controls, and therefore that is what we prefer to have. Now, what is the, the role of computer science in this? What is the role of computer science here? Now, without going into too much detail, let me introduce a concept that. Without going into too much detail, let me introduce uh, the blockchain technology in a very simple way. I'm sure you all, <coughs> I heard you talking about databases and so on, so you're quite familiar with databases. This is a, a database which has records. Again, being computer students, I'm sure you have studied about linked lists and so on, how the links are maintained and how they're linked together. So this is a linked list in a way, with a big difference to a normal database where these links are maintained. It is a, a chain which will carry a cryptographic hash of the previous block of data. So therefore from the, the time that you generate, we call it the genesis uh, root uh, block that we create, that is one that starts everything like by file system, your root and then your branches. So from that onwards, you start coming on to the, uh, the, the block with the hash from the previous uh, block. So which means that you are assuring the user that the data that is up to that point is protected by that encryption. Of course, you have to use a good encryption. I don't know whether your colleague went to details like SHA, 1, 2, 3, and 22, 56, and so on. So there are encryption mechanisms that will give you that assurance. And you get a block that is kind of logged with the data, and also, very interestingly, a timestamp. So if you want to go back at any point and, and, and track the, the, the flow of this data, you have timestamp, you have the, 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 the protection, as well as the data within that block. So when you add a new block, that becomes a new block, but it has the hash of the previous one and a new timestamp and new data. So that is how this blockchain, because it is a chain of blocks, we call it blockchain technology. And again, very interestingly, it is believed to be uh, invented by somebody or maybe a group of people, but we do not know who. The most popular accreditation is Satoshi Nakamoto, um, who is an anonymous person, uh, but a paper was presented in 2008 by an anonymous person outlining all this technology. Now, the important point here for the smart currencies is the fact that in a blockchain, you have this um, assurance that a cryptographic key is used to encrypt your data and therefore it is secure. And each block contains a cryptographic hash of the previous block and a timestamp and resistance to modification because once you lock it with that encryption, there is very, very little chance that one can go and change that data. Okay. So that is important, the resistance to modification. Now in currency, imagine you have a bank account with whatever bank you like and there is a possibility that I can go and change your data and siphon all your money into my account. I know it happens, but not normally. That is the assurance we have, that we have a trust between the bank and ourselves that your money will be saved. So it is the same kind of trust that we have maintained when it comes to virtual currencies, just like the real currencies. <clears throat> and also, once it is committed, once it is committed in a, in a block, it is irreversible. You cannot reverse that operation. So therefore, that also gives you the assurance of security. So in a way, it makes it hack-proof. Okay. Uh, so far, we haven't seen many people hacking into these blockchains and doing all kinds of nefarious things. I'm not going to go into the technology of hashing, but uh, I'm sure you must have studied it in your, in your courses. 
Um, the idea is that you take any arbitrary input of any size, it could be number, text, media, anything that you like, and the output, once you go through this hashing algorithm, is a fixed size, depending on what the hashing uh, algorithm is, a fixed length, 64 or 128 or obviously, as the bit count increases, your strength of the encryption increases as well. Okay, it will require more computing power, more processing capacity to do it, but it gives you a better, stronger uh, output. Now, it, it gives you alphanumeric strength. It is a, it's a combination of al alphabetic and numeric characters. Now, the unique properties of this hashing algorithms that we use are it produces a unique output. That is the hash, that is what we call the hash. And it's a one-way function. It's irreversible, you can't reverse it or you can't go back and, and extract the data. And it is treated as a digital fingerprint. So it, it is unique, so therefore that particular block will have that hash and nothing else. And the same hash is generated from the same data every time. So if you go through the encryption as many times as you like, you get the same unique uh, output. Okay? But at the same time, if you change even a single bit in your data, it will generate a completely different hash. So that, that's the, the nature of the hashing algorithms you have. Now, what is the relationship between blockchain and the smart currencies that I started talking about at the beginning? The blockchain itself has certain properties which are very relevant to the way the, the cryptocurrencies or the virtual currencies are expected to operate. And therefore, uh, building the platform on blockchain is the quite natural thing to do. And some of the reasons why people have chosen blockchain technology, uh, which I will talk about a little bit later about other applications that you can have, also for cryptocurrencies, is the fact that there are a few properties like decentralized database base of blocks. Now, in a typical database, it is generally single point. You have your data, your data is stored there. Maybe you have backup, maybe you have mirrored database, but the distribution ends there. People who do, is there anyone who, do, who, who does uh, computer networks here? Because when I was coming in the car, I met the lecturer who teaches computer networks. Anyone who does computer networks, who, who learns? Have you come across a similar database, distributed database in networking? Now, the domain name system, the DNS. Now that is an application which has been there for the last since the beginning of the internet, the DNS system was a distributed database. Because the idea is that if you are in Sri Lanka, if you want to do a, a conversion from your IP address to the, uh, the host name or backwards, you don't go to the United States to do that. You have, you have to have distributed DNS in every country, every institution, every, uh, at every level. So we have known about these decentralized databases or distributed databases for quite some time. The difference here is that it is now going to store these blocks that I showed you before. So it is, it is a chain of blocks, but it is distributed as well. Now that is an ideal place for us to store this public digital ledger. The same kind of ledger that, that we have in a, in a bank, not identical, but the ledger that you have the bank, now it is distributed across the internet. So as long as you have the internet, it is there available in every node connected to this uh, uh, blockchain technology system. What is the advantage? What are the advantages? The first thing, if a node goes down, just like our DNS, it still works, because there are other nodes which can be used to do your blockchain uh, manipulations. Secondly, because it is distributed, your response times can be quite fast. Imagine the same situation where if you want to resolve an address, you have to go to the United States to do it. It will take much longer than doing it next door. Okay. So the same, same principle, you have this distributed public ledger, which can be quite fast. And also, if a node goes down, the other nodes are there to help you with it. Now, there's another point which is different from the DNS. In the blockchain, there's something called the validation. Now, you have, even when you go through a transaction, your authenticity will have to be validated. 
Now the validation is not done just by one node. It is a consensus of more than one. What do you think is the reason? Although I said that the block can, cannot be mutated, we do not want to trust because I know we have some smart guys here, very intelligent and so on, so I might find that tomorrow some of my blocks are mutated. Okay, so therefore we don't want to trust that all blocks are same. So what we want is a consensus that many nodes agree that it, the validation is either the true or false. Okay, so therefore the distributed nature gives you that average advantage as well when it comes to blockchain uh, operations. So this is created to protect the block of data because uh, uh, when you come to verify information, uh, we also record all transactions. Uh, it is an audit trail that you have, so you can have a complete uh, uh, record of all the actions. And it is a, it, it has now become this blockchain technology, uh, uh, a, a, a platform for any kind of sensitive data. Any kind of sensitive data, not just um, the cryptocurrencies I started. Uh, mentioning. Energy industry, very important because it's a national critical infrastructure and therefore we need to protect all the information in that. Uh, health and medical, it is now slowly, be, uh, you, you must have a, heard about the NHS uh, uh, hack in the United Kingdom uh, uh, last year and uh, that created a lot of uh, uh, heartache uh, to patients as well as the NHS because your personal data is now in the open if somebody hacks it. Uh, smart contracts, uh, again, like smart currencies um, between people. Um, currency is also a contract, but this is extending it beyond. It could be a government to government contract, government to contractors contract, education contracts, but they all, once you sign it and once you are putting it in blockchain, it is preserved, it is, it is protected. So therefore, uh, the application of blockchain is uh, good for that kind of smart uh, applications. Digital identity, again, the idea is that you have a smart card uh, which you will have all your personal data and so on, and we don't want to be, uh, it to be shared with everyone in the world because it's some, something that is personal. Blockchain is something to protect that. Supply chain is another one because uh, um, of various uh, complexities in the supply chain, and management becomes very, very easy if you have uh, uh, built the supply chain over the uh, uh, blockchain technology. Um, I have a particular interest in IoT systems because I believe uh, for many uh, countries like Sri Lanka, the developing countries and where you have smart people with very high intelligence, uh, this is an um, upcoming industry which has a lot of potential. People are talking about 50 billion devices. How many people are on this earth at the moment on the planet? Roughly? 7.2 billion. We are talking of 50 billion devices connected down to the internet. And these devices are going to be smart and they're going to talk to each other. They're going to share information between. So unless you have some kind of, already people have hacked into IoT devices, you must have read about all kinds of stories where uh, a car has been hacked, the General Motors in the United States. You can hack into their uh, steering mechanism, stop the car right in the, in, the, in the middle of the road. That is because the security systems are not good. Okay? And if you, if you have your Fitbit, all your personal data is transferred to your computer, somebody can hack in the middle and then your personal data is on the internet the next minute. Okay? So that kind of uh, uh, security lapses are there in the IoT systems right now. But if you build, one of the things, obviously it's going to be more expensive, IoT devices will become more expensive. And also it will require more processing capacity in order to be able to use the blockchain technology with IoT system. But it has to happen because we need the security for that uh, system as well. And finally, when it comes to payments, we are, that is where the currencies come in. Traditionally, we have bartered using uh, you know, uh, systems where currency was not involved because you have uh, something that you give me and I have something in return. That's how the, the trade started. Then gradually people started using coins and paper, notes and so on. So that is what we're used to. So we want the same uh, virtual currencies to be applied for payment as well. Etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The list goes on. I just wanted to give you a flavor of what can be done uh, 
using blockchain. Now, very interestingly, cryptocurrencies became known due to side effect. That was not the intention of whoever invented, we do not know who invented blockchain, this, uh, Satoshi uh, Nakam Nakamoto is the one who was given the anonymous name, but um, he is credited for inventing the decentralized digital cash system, which was a side effect of the blockchain inventor. Now the blockchain, as I said, can be used for many other hundreds of different things, and cryptocurrency is just one of them. And um, it is a peer-to-peer -peer system, so therefore it is decentralized, and therefore there is no single trusted server. That is the key point when it comes to validation, we do not trust just one server. Whereas in a, in a centralized system, we have complete trust on the central server that we have. And uh, the very first cryptocurrency uh, known to the world is the Bitcoin. How many of you have Bitcoin? Do you own any? No? You know how to own a Bitcoin? You can buy Bitcoins if you have a lot of money. What is the other way of owning a Bitcoin? No one is mining coins these days? No? Oh, that's a very good uh, lucrative business to, business to get into. You know, you young people, you have a lot of time. The process is that it's called mining a coin. And what you do is you, um, uh, you set up hundreds of computers together. Why oh, do you have a supercomputer? And you try to solve the hash problem that the Bitcoin is uh, giving you. And at the beginning, of course, at the beginning of the Bitcoin uh, chain, the hash uh, manipulation was much simpler. So therefore, you could use your laptop or single computer to crack the hash, and, or not to crack the hash, to solve the hash. And therefore, once you solve it, you get a certain number of Bitcoins in return as your payment. So that's called mining. Now mining has become more and more uh, difficult because as you mine more coins, the hash becomes more complex. And that is the nature of the blockchain. So therefore, as you mine more and more, the hash becomes more and more complex and therefore your computing power that is needed to mine a coin is also exponentially increasing. And today, somebody will have to have a room full of high performance graphic processor type computers in order to mine a coin. But of course the rewards are also high. And right now if you uh, mine uh, a coin, you get 12.5 bitcoins as your reward. Okay? Imagine uh, a bitcoin at 10,000 euros or something, 120,000 euros as, as your reward. Okay? But the, the downside is you have to invest a lot of money in buying all the computing power as well as, in order to manipulate the hash, you need a lot of time. So you'll be spending a lot of money on electricity to run the systems and on your air conditioning to keep it cool. Okay. So that's a, that's a debate, a big debate about the cryptocurrencies, the value of, uh, as a technical um, interest, that is a very important thing. Research interest, very important, but practicality is, is still doubted because of this um, very high cost. Uh, we talked about the advantages over the centralized systems. Uh, this is money that cannot, cannot be censored. A central bank can't say, this is how you spend your bitcoins. They cannot say, this is the value of bitcoin. It is market driven. Right now, the bitcoin, it went up to about $16,000. Uh, last uh, January. That is because people think bitcoins are valuable. Now if people think bitcoins are not valuable, it will then fall down and it will pick up again. It's not, it's not governed by the Bank of America or the Federal uh, Bank of uh, the U US or the Central Bank in Sri Lanka, it is not. So that is why it is preferred as a, as a, as a borderless currency, as a smart currency that we would like to use. It is hailed as a disruptive technology, um, and we hope that will topple the traditional banking systems. So one day you walk and you will not see any of the uh, Bank of Ceylon. Of you. I shouldn't say this, but okay. So that's the idea. It will topple the traditional. Um, that is a is a kind of flow where uh, the blockchain starts uh, with a with a request, um, and of course anyone can use it. 
uh, this is open, this is public. There are private blockchains which you can build on the uh, the, uh, the, 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 the public blockchain technology. Uh, the private ones are of course closed, whereas the normal blockchains are open. It's open to any one of you, 7.2 billion people in the world. Now, the way it operates is that you have to have certain software, which is the blockchain technology software downloaded and installed in uh, your computer, after which you uh, manipulate your, uh, your request and so on through the interface that is provided with software. Now, the way it works is that you um, make a request to, a, to make a payment, then it goes to a process uh, of validation. It is distributed to many nodes, and the nodes will then uh, look at the data that is coming in, it, it will compare it with whatever the known parameters within the system, and if all agree, or the majority agree, because one could have been compromised, so therefore we do not trust that server, so if majority agrees, then it will be validated. Now once the, the, the block is validated, the next process is that it is added to the chain, so the blockchain starts doing, and the uh, notification will be generated so that the, the, the transaction is completed. And uh, then, of course, it will, the, 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 if, it is a, if it is a blockchain for cryptocurrencies, the cryptocurrency will be added to the, the chain of cryptocurrencies that you have. Okay, so that is how the uh, blockchain technology works with cryptocurrencies. Now, I mentioned a few keywords uh, previously, but uh, the reason why cryptocurrencies are preferred when it comes to certain uh, transactions is that it is irreversible. After confirmation, transaction cannot be reversed. You can't say, no, no, I didn't agree to pay you, or you took the money uh, by force because everything is locked, it's transacted, so you have made a request, you have made a payment, it's a commitment, and that, that is why it is so important for contracts as well. It is pseudonymous because you are, uh, you are a machine, not you are a machine, no. No, you, have, you are a human, but your transactions are originated by a machine. Okay, it is not your signature anymore. You do, you go to the bank and you sign your withdrawal sheet, and then you get the money. It, it is not like that. It is originated in a machine. The only connection that you have to the outside world is your IP address. Right. So you can actually track back to that IP address, but it cannot be connected to a person because I could be using this computer now, the next minute somebody else. So therefore it cannot be connected to a person or an account. So currency is delivered as an address again, so the, the, the notification will be a long 30 digit character address. So therefore it is, it cannot be connected to a person or an account. It is fast and global, I explained why it is fast, because of this distributed nature, the, 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 uh, the uh, computations can happen very quickly. Typically, uh, validation can take, say, 10 uh, seconds to 20 seconds. A confirmation can take one minute to 10 minutes. So it's, even if it is a global, global transaction, it's quite fast. It is secure. Again, I don't want to go into encryption, but you heard from your colleague that you have your uh, cryptographic keys. One is public uh, and the other one is private, and the private key is needed to decrypt your your computer. So even if somebody else gets the, the final uh, uh, cryptocurrency address, you need your, your private key to decrypt it. And it is permissionless. That is the one thing I started with. You don't have to get permission from anyone. As long as you are willing to use Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency uh, platform, you um, take responsibility for your actions. The current status, uh, as I said, the Bitcoin is the first ever cryptocurrency or virtual currency uh, coined in 2009, and there are about 150 different cryptocurrencies right now. The most popular known are these, I've just listed them. Um, there are Litecoins and uh, uh, eCashers and Zcash and all kinds of different ones. Ethereum is also quite uh, quite popular, uh, and uh, uh, some of them are still in their infancy, uh, unlike Bitcoin because Bitcoin is one of the because it was the first one. It's quite it was quite known. Uh, now because of the certain properties that uh, banks have considered as uh, useful. There's an attempt to create their own cryptocurrency by four large banks, banks 
uh, Deutsche Bank, Santander, USB, and Bank of New York, they have got together to create their own cryptocurrency. So in the in the near future, you might see an addition to the 150 to become 150 or maybe 155. And that will have a cryptocurrency which is only for the use by this. So it is a kind of private, public cryptocurrency for their own operation. Now, as you see, you go from individuals to organizations, and it doesn't stop there, because uh, even whole countries have accepted cryptocurrencies. And the first one to, uh, first nation to accept cryptocurrencies uh, is Venezuela, and other countries like uh, Estonia, Russia, Dubai, Sweden, Japan, the list goes on. They have started accepting, legally accepting or, or making the, the Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency transaction legal in their countries. There are a few other countries which are in the pipeline, like India, China, US, UK, uh, and a few other countries. They are in the pipeline. They are working towards um, uh, accepting uh, cryptocurrencies as legal tender. Now, having said that, there are 200 plus countries in the UN uh, country list. There are other countries which are banned. Brazil has said, no, we don't want cryptocurrencies. So there are other countries who have said, no, we don't want. Okay? There are good reasons for that, but there are many countries who will accept cryptocurrencies. Perhaps the other countries will, once the, other, the most countries accept, the others will follow suit as well. Now, I said I have a forensic interest in the cryptocurrency operations. One of the problems is that um, it's a good thing that you cannot connect a cryptocurrency operation to a person or an individual, but at the same time, it is a bad thing when it comes to forensics. Because forensics is finding out what happened or who did what after something bad has happened. So what do you think is, the, is a bad thing that could happen with the uh, cryptocurrencies? Say it again. Steal a Bitcoin? Yes, yes, you could. But um, again, as I said, it is protected by your private key. So unless you have used a very, uh, uh, not very strong key, or you have shared the key with someone else, it's very difficult to steal unless somebody hacked into your system and you had some clues as to generate your key. Because these keys are, we have ways of tracking keys, I'm sure all your computing students know how to do that. But we can crack, easily crack um, small length keys. But when it comes to long length keys, it is with the current computer technology. Maybe when it comes to uh, quantum technology and compu quantum computing, uh, cracking might become much easier, but right now it is not easy. You might take 10 years to crack a key, and that's, that's not the time that we, people will want to wait. Um, the the um, issue is that transactions can be made completely anonymously. Because it cannot be connected to a person, you can make a transaction completely anonymously. Now, this is good for good people like us. But in the world, there's also people who would like to hide their transactions and actions and various uh, other information. So this happens especially in a place called the dark web or the deep, deep web, um, which is very popular amongst people. If you have uh, used dark net uh, or deep web, it's not a bad thing. Don't, don't worry. I'm just asking. How many of you have used it or heard about it? No? You have heard? Okay, go, go and do some Googling and find out what it is. It is a good thing. But the thing is, as any other good thing, this can be used also for bad things. And criminals or people who engage in illegal activities, they prefer to use the dark web or deep web as opposed to the flat web, as you call it, the normal web. The reason being, every uh, action that you uh, go through when you go through the dark, deep web is encrypted and it is hidden from the rest of the world. It's all, almost like a virtual private network. Once you, once you start doing something, the rest, how many of you are using VPNs? You're very, very good. No, 
using again using VPN is not a bad thing. That is for own self protection. The idea is that everything is secure once you have VPN tunnel because no one else can see it. The trouble with the internet is that everything you do can be seen by others because it's a public network. So what people have tried to do by VPN is a virtual private network. So it's a good thing for you. Deep web is a virtual private network as long as you use it for good things. But the trouble is there are people who are now using the deep web to engage in illegal criminal activities. Now, because of the properties of blockchain and because of the cryptocurrency uh, transactions are handled in a particular secure way, when they are used for things like money laundering, it is very difficult for the forensic investigators to find out who is responsible. Okay? So therefore, it has now become a challenge. I started with one challenge. I wanted to invent a cryptocurrency which will solve all my problems. But by doing that, I end up having another problem because it's much more difficult to analyze, to investigate, to examine transactions when they are done through deep webs or dark webs. Okay? So this has become a haven for criminals because they can now use a cryptocurrency, a Bitcoin, they can do all the transactions using bitcoins and forensic investigators have become now helpless. So that's why I said I'm interested in the research side of things in order to understand how these uh, uh, forensic investigators can be helped to uh, understand the deep web and the cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology a little better. Anyway, in conclusion, oh, I've taken 10 minutes more. I'm so sorry about it. Uh, in conclusion, let me uh, uh, again re-emphasize the computer science's contribution to it. So it is starting with the cryptography and the databases and distributed computing and all that coming from computer science. Uh, because of that we have the, the cryptocurrencies and I believe that they are here to stay. Okay? It will become mainstream quite soon and to be, we will be transacting in bitcoins. Next time when I come, I'll be paying uh, for my uh, pay stay in bitcoins. Even now I can do it, I don't do it now. But that, because I don't think uh, the hotels in Columbus still accept uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, it solves the challenge. It creates the electronic cash system that will trade across nations without the need for traditional banks. Transactions are secure, immutable, irreversible, difficult to track. Now, difficult to track is a good and a bad thing. Inherently secure because we believe that at the moment you have SHA-256 kind of um, uh, crypto, crypto uh, key cannot be uh, hacked. So transaction is stored in thousands of nodes and hacking one node is, is not enough. That's another beauty of the, uh, the uh, distributed nature and mining becomes inherently or increasingly harder but of course your rewards are much higher so when i finish i'm sure you will run and get your computer start mining bitcoins thank you very much city so i also heard about the mr satoshi nakamoto but some people are believing he is not a person, he is, it's an organization. Mm -hmm. Sir, my uh, first question is, how can we join with this cryptocurrency chain or Bitcoin chain and how can we earn money by using powerful machines at home in this uh, blockchain technology? Mm -hmm. Right, yep, very true. Uh, we do not know who uh, this uh, Nakamoto is. He's anonymous and um, uh, it could be one person, it could be an organization, but the result of the work is the birth of the blockchain technology and the Bitcoin. So that's the first part of it. Secondly, how do you earn money? Uh, I think I explained, uh, you've, got a lot of in, you've got to invest a lot of money to earn money. Uh, at the beginning coining, uh, sorry, at the beginning of Bitcoins, uh, mining a coin was quite easy. Because the, the way it works is the blockchain, as you grow, your, your hash becomes more difficult to uh, manipulate. So therefore at the beginning when you have just one or two coins mined, 
the third, mining the third coin was much easier. So you could have used your single laptop or single desktop computer to do it. It might have taken a couple of days, but that is the processing power that is needed. Now today I don't have a picture, but if you go to the, 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 the net, you will find a lot of examples right now. A room full of computers are needed to, to, to mine a coin today. It doesn't matter if this is a Bitcoin, a Litecoin, or any other coin, but you need a lot of computing power. So that is the investment you have to make to start with. So what people do is they pool their computing power. If you have 10 people, you, you pool your 10 computers and then start mining. That's number one. Secondly, the energy consumption of hundreds of computers mining for days and days is going to be quite high. And also to keep them cool, as I said, in Sri Lanka, especially when it's hot, you have your air condition, your rooms, and so on, so there'll be another energy bill coming from that. Now, the argument is whether it is worthwhile to mine a coin today because of the, the cost that you have incurred in order to mine one. Again, you might, might not be lucky because there are thousands of miners right now. Not thousands, tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands of miners right now. So you'll be one out of them to be lucky to get that. Of course, if you're lucky, right now, if you if you mine a Bitcoin, you get 12.5 Bitcoins, right? So that is the reward you get. So if you want to earn money, be lucky, invest a lot of money, and try and mine a coin. So there are some few questions. Can you give some uh, idea about value for cryptocurrencies? So like uh, one Bitcoin equal to how much dollars? Yeah, very market. interesting question. Uh, can you tell me how much is a dollar today in rupees? But yesterday? It varies. The same is true for, now the, the difference is, it's, it's the same story for bitcoins, it varies. The difference is, in your dollar rupee case, the central bank decides how much it will be today, and tomorrow they'll say, oh yeah, because of various changes in the money market, it will be this. Now, that is central control, because they talk to Bank of England, they talk to uh, uh, the, the Federal Bank in the US. So that is how the money market is um, maintained. Whereas in cryptocurrencies, it is market driven. It's a free market. And as I mentioned, January this year, 2018, a Bitcoin was $16,000. Now it is averaging about $4,500. Tomorrow, it might be 10 cents, and I'll definitely run and buy a few, but that cannot be predicted. So there's no fixed value for it. It changes, it varies. It's like the stock market, because this is this is pretty much a stock market game we are playing here with the cryptocurrencies. So you, the demand will uh, decide what the value of the, the currency is. So uh, are there any limitations of uh, Bitcoins in this world? Are there limitations? In what sense? Um, quantity. Yes, yes, you're right. I, there's something I uh, thank you for that. I did mention it. Um, there is a total number of bitcoins that you can mine. The total will be 21 million dollars, and already 17 million have been uh, co coined. Okay. So the Bitcoin, that, that is why it is becoming more and more valuable because when a quantity is scarce, then you have you have value for that. So people will be happy to uh, to, to uh, pay any amount of money for that. So uh, it will become a, um, um, a kind of limited uh, supply will uh, make the demand more and therefore people believe that's why they invest money to coin, uh, to, to mine a coin and also buy the coins because they believe that eventually when you have reached the, the threshold, your value will go up. Now, the, the solution to that is there are other cryptocurrencies like Litecoin and various other things I mentioned. Their limit is much higher and they have not been mined very much. So if you are thinking of mining, the rewards may not be very high like Bitcoin, but there are other options as well. So my last last question is, uh, what are the system have to protect this cryptocurrency chain? What are the uh, what are the systems have to protect this cryptocurrency uh, chain in this world? What are the systems? What are the systems uh, methods have to protect this uh, cryptocurrency Bitcoin chain from uh, cyber, uh, cyber hackers and 
Well, I think that, that was the main thing I was trying to say. By design, the blockchain is a secure uh, and um, kind of uh, unhackable system, right? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't hack a block. But because it is a decentralized distributed database, where the validation and verification is based on more than one node, if one node is compromised, it doesn't matter. I think my last, if you, if you have seen my very last line of uh, conclusion, what I said was, the, you might hack one node, but that isn't enough, because there are thousands of other nodes which will keep the, keep the same block. Okay, so hacking one node is not going to disrupt your blockchain because the moment it is known that that node is hacked, how do we know that the node is hacked? Because there's no consensus. When it comes to valid validation, 999 will agree that this is the, 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 the verification, and one node will not agree because it is now hacked and it is different. So therefore you reject that node. Yes, that means that the person who's going to hack, you have, you have to, to uh, hack a million uh, nodes. More than million. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions of this conference, which is a brilliant conference, I, I just had a peek of it, and again, the, uh, the wonderful audi audience I have, and very attentive, and asking a lot of questions. So this, you have done a really good job, and I congratulate all the organizers, and thank especially Vijendra and uh, Captain uh, yes, Janaka for giving me the opportunity uh, to be here, and uh, thank you very much, and have a very good conference. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening speech. I would like to invite Brigadier A. Savi Singha, Rector, Southern Campus, accompanied by Dean, Faculty of Computing, Captain Janaka Gulasila, to present a token of appreciation to our special guest speaker, Professor Abe Indurua.